Hello and welcome to this video on big data and the theme of this presentation is an introduction to the big data science. I'm going to make an attempt to explain big data um, to what it is today and where it is going um, to the next level and we are going to understand what big data is, why learn big data, and who is it for. So in these three, we are going to understand what big data really is, and why are we going to make an attempt to learn big data, and who is it really for, and ultimately who is it going to benefit. And now how to start learning big data is the next thing, and when is the best time for you to learn it and ultimately looking at the objectives and benefits of learning big data technologies. So what is big data? All in all, it is large scale data management. We will look at several of the companies who have come out with the data management frameworks like Google, uh, Facebook, Amazon later in our presentation. And we will see how the big data science and analytics has been perfected by these companies. So managing very large amounts of data and extracting value from the, from the knowledge is the theme of uh, our big data science. Uh, what is big data and what makes that data big? That's what we are going to look into about the definition, there is no standard definition as of now because we have seen data explosion across the globe and so therefore um, in some words we may explain it as big data is the data whose scale, diversity and complexity require new architecture, techniques, algorithms and analytics to manage it and extract value and hidden knowledge from it. So examples are those companies like Google, Wikipedia, Amazon, Facebook, eBay, and a horde of others. So that's the data explosion diagram where we see there are business processes generating data and that's traditionally stored in the databases like Oracle or MS SQL Server or IBM's DB2. And now we have the next level that is a human generated data which could be email, web logs, documents, social networks like Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, etc. And then coming to the next level of machine generated data which is the uh, CCTV videos, sensors, satellite imaging, medical records and machine to machine learning uh, log files. So the multiplier becomes um, like 1x or 10 times or like 100 times and hence we have uh, seen this as data explosion and continuing with that explosion the generation of data is done through web purchases at departmental stores um, bank transactions health care records so and so forth uh, we have several places and several sources of data generation. If you look at the numbers, Google processes about 20 petabytes a day. That's a figure of 20, 2008. And uh, if you look at other figures like Wayback Machine, Facebook, eBay, CERNs, each has got a massive amount of data generation happening uh, per day or per month. So those are the numbers. You can have a look. And these numbers, due to several of the uh, enterprises, multiply to unimaginable um, amount of data. So. There are four primary characteristics of big data. The first one being scale. So data volume is 
this is an example that there is 44 times increase from 2009 to 2020 uh, and that's gone from about 0.8 zettabytes to 35 zettabytes. Uh, the next one in line we obviously have Yorabyte and we are obviously moving towards that direction now. So it's a matter of concern for many enterprises that we uh, now look towards big data projects and um, start to learn big data. So uh, these are further few numbers as we see and the second characteristic is complexity. So first one being the scale of data and the second is the complexity. So this, uh, the type of data is uh, not just one, like earlier we would have text and images. So it is now videos and uh, this one happens to be a uh, genome sequence. Uh, you've got uh, universe and galaxies and astronomical data and so and so forth. Uh, we have got several uh, types of data these days. So you got these text, numerical images, audio, and uh, that's how we have the complexity or the variety of data types. The third one is speed, the velocity at which big data is being generated. So that is how we have data analytics and uh, that is how it makes it also online application or analytical processing. So the examples for this, you've got e-promotions based on your current location, your purchase history. Um, uh, you could, uh, the, it is sent right away to your uh, uh, computing machine. Healthcare monitoring, it's the same thing. It's sent you know, straight, straight away. Uh, the third, these are three V's and uh, we see the variety, velocity and volume, three V's and uh, the, the two graph shows the increase in the volume of data and then in the increase in the data variety and complexity on X axis. So as we look at through the table here, which shows ERP, CRM, web and now we are moving towards big data. So. Traditionally, there's been ERP processing, enterprise resource planning, which was uh, taken over by CRM, customer relationship management, and then moving up to web-based uh, uh, services, and now it's obviously moving to the big data. So those are the three Vs. And now some call it as the fourth V. There's some one fourth V, which is the data in doubt. Much of the data is uncertain, and we are not really certain about its validity. So that is how some put it as veracity. Hence, you got these four types, volume, velocity, variety, and veracity, each of them having their own characteristics. That is the data at rest, which is volume, and it could be increasing. Velocity, so that's um, the data in motion. Variety, that data in many forms, finally data in doubt. So in order to harness big data, traditionally we have seen online application processing, online transaction processing, and now we are moving up to the real time analytics processing where the big data architecture harnesses this technology. So it's more real time in nature rather than just online one-time transactions, it's real time. So if we have 24 hours in a day by a big data project, we would mean that the analytics, the generation and uh, the result is a consistent process by the way of machine learning and other algorithms that we put into big data projects. So who's, big, who's generating the big data? Uh, that includes, again, several different sources like social media, scientific instruments, mobile devices, sensor technology and networks, so and so forth. We have several sources of generation. So the next part of our learning is why learn big data? And now the model has changed. The old model was few companies were generating data and all of us were consuming. 
However, now this model has changed to all of us are generating data and all of us are consuming the data. So this is how the model has changed to real-time analytics and a much uh, bigger scale at which our projects are required to be executed. The big data types are put into certain categories here which include the web and social media, machine to machine learning, big data transaction, transaction data, biometrics and human generated. These are not just restricted to these five the big data types, they can span even more types of data as and when we execute the projects for um, the, the industry. So we can have a look at each of these. So what's driving big data? As we've seen the big data types, what's driving big data is the business value on the x-axis as we see and the complexity on the y-axis. And each of them have got their own um, magnitudes. So as and when we move further towards business value and towards complexity, we see that the, the graph or the time graph is increasing so we have more uh, resources to be put into that particular area uh, therefore in the when both of these are lower we have business intelligence solutions and moving towards a larger scale we have predictive analytics and data mining so in business intelligence there could be add a query data mining structured data typical sources and small to mid-sized data sets whereas in predictive analytics we have optimizations and uh, complex statistical analysis and they are very large data sets and we also have something called as machine learning and machine intelligence so by that we mean that our machines uh, keep becoming intelligent they keep learn le they keep learning as and when the data is processed so who is it for the value of big data analytics as we have seen it's more a real time than traditional data warehousing applications it's supposed to be more real time in nature uh, the best example we can quote is google's like as soon as you put a google query uh, google analytics is processing it somewhere so that the next time when you again put a similar query it's going to give you an intelligent result based on your previous query so uh, the traditional data warehouse architectures would be exadata which is from oracle teradata uh, from teradata incorporation and so those are not well suited for big data applications Shared nothing, massive parallel processing, scale out architectures are well suited for big data applications. So we are going to look at um, that further. Um, the big data market is a whooping $50 billion market by 2017. And how does it work? We have data collection, data processing, analysis, and data execution. These four boxes together are going to make up entire projects and that's how uh, the value reaches to a $50 billion mark by 2017. We have got a lot of challenges in handling big data. Predominant factor is the scale of data. And uh, that makes it really complex for us to process the data. So hence, as we see the big data boom, the storage growth has gone from uh, so many of millions of petabytes in 2005 to several more million by 2015. 
and uh, that's how we have the lack of software and technology, lack of analytic skills, insufficient budgets, and we are already using some of it. So those are the bottlenecks. Uh, we require new architecture, algorithms, techniques are needed, and also the skill. Human resources and manpower is obviously uh, required to execute these projects. So what technologies do we have for big data? The landscape is wide and huge because there are several companies who are already into big data technologies. If I start with the big data landscape here, we can look at the infrastructure, operational infrastructure, infrastructure as a service, structured databases, analytics and visualization, business intelligence, vertical apps, data providers, and log data apps. And underneath all of these, we have the technologies based on Hadoop. So we are shortly going to look at what Hadoop is and the related technologies. But foremost, we need to look at uh, the entire landscape which includes these categorical entities um, that, that make up the big data projects. So for example, we have analytics infrastructure where Cloudera has, is one of the major players. Operational inf infrastructure, you got Teradata, which provides several of the rack infrastructure. Um, in Amazon is one of the infrastructure as a service, so it provides uh, Amazon Web Services, wherein you can have entire virtual machines. And Google is another which has now uh, got into this. Uh, structured databases, so the Google Cloud, if we go to cloud.google.com, that's as of now, uh, it's a new uh, offering by Google. And then you got the structured databases, uh, which is Oracle and MySQL. Uh, these are two put together as Oracle has acquired MySQL. Then Microsoft SQL Server, Postgres, and MemSQL. Uh, moving further, sorry, into analytics. So we have the players like Teradata, EMC, uh, and, and others into analytics and visualization. Sorry again. So we have uh, business intelligence uh, vendors including Oracle, IBM and so and so forth and uh, you got other vendors providing their own uh, you know solutions so there's data providers and then log data apps and vertical data apps so these are supposed to be applications uh, and hard so all in all it is hardware and software uh, products which are put into the big data landscape by these industry players. Underneath, we are going to have a look at Hadoop, uh, which make a basis of uh, our big data platform. And that's what we are going to look into much detail a little, little afterwards. So the big data technology is uh, as I said, based on Hadoop, we have got the Hadoop layer here, and based on that, you've got several of the vendors and their uh, uh, so analytic software and, and going further into the applications. So ultimately, we have the business objectives on which we are going to you know, have the projects built. Now, how to get started on the big data platform? So we need to know the platform, the basis, what is required, and look at the languages like Java, C, Python, etc. There are high level languages like Apache Pig, Hive, and then there are tools on top of Hadoop like Radoop and Mahout, which is a set of libraries um, which enhance your processing capabilities. And the state of the art technology from research papers. So there's, there are papers which are uh, often published by several companies. Now these are some of the popular vendors. 
categorized into four different layers. So we've got big data infrastructure, you've got data infrastructure, data management, movement, and analytics and applications. So these are somewhat refined than the previously seen landscape. And we see that there is infrastructure which is obviously needed. And how do we access that? So and so forth and making it as a smart grid. And there are certain industry players like Dell, Oracle, HP and so and so forth which provide hardware and certain system software products like you know VMware's uh, virtual machines and same goes for Microsoft's and then there is data management so we've got Cloudera as I said earlier we've got IBM's Big Insight Oracle's uh, big data essentials, EMCs. So these are the players which are giving their own offerings. And finally, going on to the analytics and applications. So next is when to learn big data. Well, anyone um, mature enough can go ahead and learn big data. It depends in, on why you are learning it and where are we going to be after we have the entire learning curve. So it's a matter of putting substantial amount of efforts to learn big data and master it, thus putting it into efficient use and putting, putting your skills into um, development activities for your projects. So um, this slide being for the engineering graduates or even the non-engineering graduates um, who are recruited into the companies, so the fresher candidates and those doing their electronics and communications or electrical engineering and, or civil or even mechanical, those have been seen to lack uh, their potential uh, when they are into the uh, IT companies. So I would say that it's, it's best for them too to learn these technologies so that they can put their core skills and these activities together. They, it makes a good mix um, to move up the, up the ladder. Pre-graduation again is the right time to learn big data technologies because if you master, if you learn it, if you start it now, you're going to master it by next two years. So if you are in the second year or third year of graduation, that's the right time. Big data involves not just several tools, but numerous technologies, methodologies, and mathematical and or statistical concepts. These need to be thought, developed, and applied appropriately to reach a certain goal. So we are going to um, learn this second point as soon as you move into uh, learning big data skills. And lastly, the algorithms and computing languages are required to practically turn big data into applied intelligence. So once we are skilled enough to learn languages like uh, Java, C, Python, R, etc., and the algorithms and the skills to put uh, these into a project, that's where we are actually going to benefit from it and get the value out of it. So why to learn big data now? S big data has been uh, in the industry for well over three to four years and the sooner it is the better. So if you are a flexible mind, learning Hadoop and related stuff can rightly position you to a right job. It's like synonymous to a three year diploma course. So it depends how quickly you move up you know, and learn uh, big data. So resources and books, there is no specific syllabus as we have seen. However, there are immense amount of books already available on the net. And so it's also evolutionary. And uh, if you start learning, then sky's the limit. So here you've got the related books and exactly where we can uh, learn further on 
big data. So there's again much of information on the net, tutorials, web, uh, YouTube videos, and uh, so most of it is open source. Anyone can have uh, an access to it and start learning if you've got a laptop and uh, a, a decent uh, amount of RAM and the CPU on the laptop. So what one needs is time, interest, energy, and a bit of foresight to work on ambitious projects. Learning curve. Some big data courses are available in the market, like Cloudera, Certified Administrator, and Ms. Apache Hadoop. Okay, so the learning curve for big data is dependent on where you start from and how quickly you're able to get to where you want to reach. So we need to know where exactly we want to reach. Cloudera publishes two of their courses, which is for administrators and the second one is for developers. So there are several perceptions and perspectives and there are several tools and all we need to know is the right direction to get started. Who learns what is more important? So clear goals and learning curves for admins and developers and we are going to see that the combination of both is the right mix. However, it depends if you're going for a career then there are uh, clearly administrative and developer based courses. So starting with big data, the virtual machine environment is best suited. That is, you need to have a virtual machine or if you don't know what a virtual machine is, we need to have an understanding of a virtual machine, even though a virtual machine is not necessary. Um, you can have several different uh, physical machines with operating systems like Linux, that could be Red Hat Enterprise Linux, SUSE Linux, CentOS, Ubuntu, or Fedora, or, or there are several others on which Hadoop is supported. So Hadoop platform, Hadoop is basically a software written in Java. So the other core necessity is the Java runtime environment, which we need to have on our operating system. Cloudera Quick Start VM is the best way to start if you are looking to um, gearing up. Uh, Cloudera publishes virtual machines and you can download it from the Cloudera website. Now, after downloading it, there is a good amount of documentation wherein you can know um, how uh, Big Data works and what are the subsystems. And lastly, there are some needed software packages. To start from the beginning, we can also start by a customized Linux distribution, customized uh, Hadoop installation, and Java installation, and everything customized. And uh, so therefore, we have some of the players like Cloudera publishing uh, the, the virtual machines and other software for us to uh, know from 50 onwards so we don't have to start counting from 1 we can straight away go to 50 and move towards 100 so let's now look at an introduction to Hadoop which stands for highly available distributed object oriented platform um, that was developed by the Apache Software Foundation and Duck Cutting is the founder and the developer of Hadoop so why Hadoop? Well, the history, historically, Google started in 1990s, as we know, in Stanford, and uh, that's where Google's upward curve started, and 2000s brought uh, management complexities in Google's data centers and data management. So as the data managed by Google was scaling far too large, Google published some white papers 
in 2004 namely MapReduce and that would provide a parallel processing framework so they were uh, these white papers namely Google file system MapReduce and Bigtable published so these are the white papers and they were analyzed and reverse engineered and re-engineered by the Apache Software Foundation and they were called as Hadoop Distributed File System or HDFS, MapReduce and Apache HBase. Now these are based entirely on Java but it's not necessary that Google's file system, MapReduce and Bigtable were also based on Java. So that's the main difference that I see today between the two and moving on into um, real world scenarios. Um, we are still yet to look at Hadoop in a little more detail. So the real world scenarios um, if we have a project um, based scenario imagine that you are a employee in a company and the boss comes to you and says here are 50 gigabytes of log files and find a way to improve our business so what would you do and where would you start and what would you do next to make your boss happy if you're not making a boss happy you're likely to be fired sometime so cloud and big data are going to help us in such scenarios because if you look at the traditional skills those are being moved to cloud and big data now the traditional transaction processing and database processing they are all being moved to the next level of IT or IT's generation to be put in another way and we have some related fields that is artificial intelligence, distributed computing, supercomputing, business analytics and business intelligence and data analytics and data mining. So these are broadly some of the uh, related fields. And here we have some of the companies which are already using Hadoop, which is Facebook, Yahoo, Amazon, eBay, American Airlines, New York Times, Federal Reserve Board, IBM and Orbitz. So those are some of the companies which already have Hadoop and related projects in place. So looking at the business problem types that Hadoop can address is risk modeling, ad targeting, trade surveillance, customer churn analysis, point of scale transaction analysis, search quality, recommendation engine, threat analysis, and data sandbox. So the common MapReduce problems. We are going to look at what MapReduce does. Previously in the slides, we looked at the three white papers that were published by Google, and that is GFS, MapReduce, and Bigtable. So here, HDFS happens to be a distributed file system in the sense that it's not like a FAT32 or NTFS or an EXT3 file system which is on a single machine. It's distributed across several clusters. Uh, it's distributed over a cluster of machines. So say that you have 10 or even 50 or 100 machines, the distributed file system is a collective structure put across 50 or 100 hard disks across these different nodes. So that's how we have distributed file system. MapReduce is a framework where the parallel processing is achieved by separating two parts. So there's one map part and the reduce part. So we would write the programs and algorithms in such a way that we write two parts one is the map and other is reduce 
so that several machines say those tens and fifties of machines are processing your program parallelly okay and then they ma they they first run the math code and parallelly they would all run the reduce code to do a parallel processing uh, ultimately we have H base as a uh, distributed database um, so traditionally we have had Oracle MySQL kind of databases um, and Apache's H base happens to be a distributed database framework so uh, moving on towards the MapReduce jobs what MapReduce can achieve is like text mining and patterns filtering indexing graphs prediction and risk analysis so those are different um, jobs that MapReduce can achieve that's a very basic introduction of our Hadoop cluster wherein we have a master node over here in red and there are three of the slave nodes which are also called as data nodes and task, task tracker so what they would do is the master node would keep a track of all the slave nodes and the slave nodes would also run the the real task that's how they are called called as a data node there could be one or more of the master nodes to in order to have high availability this is a sample uh, Hadoop cluster configuration wherein um, we have uh, the switches these are the LAN switches it's a gig gigabit Ethernet switch 48 port and then there we see that there are two of the uh, the name nodes and uh, out here on the right hand side you've got four plus four that is eight of data nodes all connected through the switch in a high availability manner so as we see that there are three of these network uh, networks put together uh, they are all put together for the high availability factor and um, so here is the management server um, which is a Cloudera manager for uh, our entire Hadoop cluster so that's 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 how um, one of the offerings of uh, the Hadoop cluster looks like and uh, so we will briefly look at the difference between what RDBMS has to offer and what Hadoop has to offer. So traditionally, RDBMS has performed database management activities. And we have had applications made to access that database and present the results, like Oracle, MySQL, uh, MS SQL Server, and so forth. Here we have the traditional management RDBMS uh, characteristics. So the data size could go into giga or terabytes at most. However, in Hadoop and MapReduce, we can move into petabytes and even into exabytes. And uh, access is interactive in batch. Here it's not interactive because it's real-time application processing. Updates are read and re written many times. Here it's just written once and read many times. The structure is static. Here you've got dynamic schema and integrity happens to be ACID compliant, whereas it's low integrity out here. And the scaling happens to be non-linear, whereas it's linear scaling in Hadoop based uh, projects. And the query response time can be near immediate and there is some latency in this due to batch processing. Now, so therefore, uh, it's not that we are absolutely going away from traditional RDBMS. They are still here to stay and uh, there are several of the projects that are still here to stay. But what we are saying is that there is another uh, type of data processing that has come into being because of Google or Google's innovation and which is you know being put into the Hadoop uh, ecosystem so looking at the databases because we have come 
into this presentation uh, through the databases because um, the, we are talking about data, isn't it? So the, the historically, the rise of relational databases happened between 80s and 90s. And then the object databases increased between 90s and 2000s. And then there was relational dominance again between 2000 and 2010. So now we have an increasing amount of activity and uh, uh, movement going from uh, the traditional to the big table. The big table is provided by Google and Dynamo is provided by Amazon. And the edge base, as we have seen, is a Hadoop subsystem. Or we can utilize the benefits of edge base through Hadoop. And the term NoSQL, which stands for not only SQL, this is a term which has been dis uh, discussed a lot on the internet and many have debated why it's termed as no SQL. The real meaning is not only SQL. The developers didn't just want SQL to be a, in, uh, in, in development. So they somehow termed it as no SQL, which literally means not only SQL, we are moving away from SQL databases to um, um, different forms of databases. So what are the different forms? We've got the ecosystem here. That's the key value pair. So these are the different types of databases categorized historically. And uh, we see the graph type of databases, document-based, which are MongoDB and CouchDB, and the co uh, column and family, which is Cassandra and Apache HBase. So those are the types of databases okay that we have these days so let's take a break here and uh, move into the past present and the future of IT industry which is obviously going to uh, uh, be as a catalyst for other industries uh, be it manufacturing or um, banking or uh, any other type of industry um, so the IT first appeared in uh, 58, so it's, it's, it's going to remain as you know, a catalyst to other areas of science and technology. And we have seen a movement from IT-driven industry to open information society. By the help of Wikipedia, IBM has created the, the marvelous uh, Watson project, which had uh, defeated the Jeopardy uh, game. So that makes uh, several of the IT vendors and giants who are going into the intelligent machines and that enforces us to rethink the, uh, the projects that you know, we are likely to create and manage today. So we are a part of Global Village via the net and uh, that's uh, commodity to most of the people around the globe and it's it's going to uh, penetrate further into the other regions of the world so the, the innovations and inventions are going to continue at similar pace and that is how um, we have made this presentation and put it across to you and lastly, we are going to look at the big data development environment. In order for you to start big data development, we need uh, to use the virtual machines, Java runtime environments, or a JDK, Hadoop and related software. And uh, it can be installed on a single or uh, cluster of machines. And uh, last but not the least, you need uh, some of the other uh, vendor offering like Cloudera CDH, IBM Big Insight, or Oracle's uh, uh, Big Data uh, and uh, EMC. So those there are several of the vendors who are providing with complete cloud-based and big data-based offerings. So uh, for that reason, it is essential for us to at least get started. 
uh, and that's why uh, I have made this uh, effort on the, in this presentation and uh, so the basic prerequisites for learning big data remains uh, basic knowledge of computers and that of Linux, uh, C and Java languages. Mostly Java is used for development, however, there are others, others that can be used. And then awareness of virtualization and cloud trends. So this brings us to the end of this presentation and I hope uh, you have uh, enjoyed uh, listening to this and I'm sure that um, you can definitely um, move up one more step after looking at this presentation. So looking forward to see your comments and, uh, and your feedback. Thanks very much. Thank you for watching.